Hi, welcome to Lesson 6. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Our hook question today is this. The Puritans who settled in the Massachusetts Bay Colony banned what? Banned means to get rid of. They actually ended up banning Christmas. You might think to yourself, how is it possible that a group of Christians could ban one of the most important Christian holidays, Christmas? And the answer to that question actually goes back thousands of years. Back to the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is about 2,000 years old. It's the earliest form of Christianity for the most part. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church you probably heard of is located in Italy. It's uh, located specifically in a place called Vatican City. And Vatican City is the home of the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. And you're probably familiar with who this person is. I know you have seen him before. There have been hundreds of popes over history, and again, the Roman Catholic Church is super, super old. And for the longest time, it was the only kind of Christianity that existed in Europe. Literally, for 1,500 years, if you were a Christian, you were a Roman Catholic. It all changed in 1517. In 1517, a guy named Martin Luther nailed some things to a door. Things that he nailed were called the 95 Theses, and he nailed them to an, a, a church in Germany. And those theses were basically complaints. They were arguments that the Pope was doing his job wrong, and that the Catholic Church was corrupt and not living up to its name. Martin Luther wanted to change the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church did not want to change. So Martin Luther ended up creating an entirely different kind of Christianity called Protestantism. So basically, Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation. So there's one Roman Catholic Church. There are many, many, many different Protestant churches. One of those Protestant churches started in England under King Henry VIII after the Protestant Reformation. Now, King Henry VIII didn't start a new church because he didn't like Catholicism. He started a new church because the Roman Catholic Church would not let him get a divorce. King Henry VIII wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragorn, his wife of 23 years, because she could not produce a male offspring. And if you're a king at this time and you don't have male offspring, you don't have an heir to the throne, meaning when you die, your line dies with you. Henry VIII could not have this, so he asked the Pope, hey, can I please divorce Catherine of Aragorn? The Pope said no. So he said, well, to heck with you, Pope. I'm going to start my own church, and I am going to be the Pope of it. And since I'm the English king, I'm going to call this the Church of England. Anyway, long story short, he divorces Catherine, marries a lady named Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn does not give him any sons. He ends up executing Anne Boleyn. Story, king Henry VIII actually went through seven wives, divorced the first, executed the second, the third died in childbirth, the fourth they separated. They just didn't live together. His fifth wife was also executed. Or I'm, I'm sorry, his sixth. And finally, his seventh wife, well, she was lucky because Henry VIII died before she did. So she, Catherine Parr, really was the only one who won out in the end. Anyway, long story short, we're talking about two kinds of Christianity here. The Catholic Church, one of the earliest kinds of Christianity based in Rome. And the Protestant churches, many newer Christian groups that formed because they were opposed to Catholicism. Remember I said King Henry VIII basically just said, hey, screw you, Pope. I'm the new Pope of my own church. And placing the Church of England kind of in the middle of Catholicism and Protestantism. The Church of England was not fully Catholic but it wasn't Protestant enough for a certain group of people in England who wanted to be far more Protestant. You see, King Henry VIII pretty much just replaced the Pope with himself and kept everything else the same. So the Church of England was still very Catholic-ish. A group of people in England called the Puritans wanted to rid the Church of England of all of its Catholicness. The leader of the Puritans, or one of the leaders, was a guy named John Winthrop. 
John Winthrop looks an awful lot like the Six Fingered Man from uh, The Princess Bride, which is a fantastic movie. Anyway, John Winthrop uh, tried very hard to change the Church of England from within England. And the English, for the most part, said, go away, John Winthrop. We do not want to become Puritan. We have our own church. So anyway, 1630, on the ship the Arabella, John Winthrop and several hundred other Puritans had to leave England. They had to leave England to escape religious persecution. Persecution is one of our key terms means treating someone with hostility because they are different. So the Puritans were forced to flee England. And when they did, John Winthrop delivered this incredibly important sermon on the ship, the Arabella, right before they set foot on the New World in Massachusetts. And in that incredibly famous sermon, he said something that was incredibly famous, specifically these lines. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. These lines are so important because for hundreds of years, American leaders have looked to this phrase, a city upon a hill, and they've used it for inspiration and to describe how they feel or what they feel America stands for. Here are two very famous presidents who used the image, a city upon a hill. John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. Right now, we're going to listen to two speeches delivered by these two presidents that mention the city upon a hill. But I have been guided by the standard John Winthrop set before his shipmates on the flagship Arabella 331 years ago, as they too faced the task of building a new government on a perilous frontier. We must always consider, he said, that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Today, the eyes of all people are truly upon us. And our governments in every branch at every level, national, state, and local, must be as a city upon a hill, constructed and inhabited by men aware of their great trust and their great responsibilities. For we are setting out upon a voyage in 1961, no less hazardous than that undertaken by the Arabella in 1630. We are committing ourselves to tasks of statecraft no less awesome than that of governing the Massachusetts Bay Colony, beset as it was by terror without and disorder within. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of a shining city of Bonnie Hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of a shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God blessed and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hung with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get there. That's how I saw it and see it still. And how stands the city on this winter night? More prosperous more secure and happier than it was eight years ago. But more than that, after 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the granite ridge, and her glow is held steady, no matter what storm. Those speeches are very, very important, and you'll notice in those speeches that the two presidents have different ideas for what the city upon a hill means. 
the text for those speeches is attached to this lesson. And what I would like you to do is read the excerpts from those speeches and come to some com conclusions about what the city upon a hill means to Americans. To John Winthrop, it meant very specifically that all eyes were on his project in Massachusetts. And all the people of the world were looking to see at wh what the Puritans were up to and whether or not their society was successful. Because John Winthrop wanted the Massachusetts Bay Colony to be a model for the whole world to follow. He wanted people in England to look at the Massachusetts Bay Colony and consider strongly whether or not they were following the right kind of Christianity. He wanted the Church of England to look at the Puritans and see how successful they were in America. And he wanted the church to reform and get rid of all of its Catholicness. And even beyond England, he wanted all of Europe to pay attention to what was going on in America and follow the Puritans' example. Literally, according to John Winthrop, he believed that his little colony in Massachusetts was involved in transforming the world to a Protestant, we call it utopia or perfect place. That was it. That's a very, very big goal, and the stakes were very high for the pilgrims. So this leads us to our essential question. What's the connection between Puritan rule, how the Puritans ran the shop in Massachusetts, and how religious freedom developed in America? Look at the Puritans. This painting says a lot about the Puritans. If you look closely, you'll see a lot of details about their society um, buried in the images in this painting. Notice the books to the left and the open book right next to the man uh, seated there with his wife. The books are there to show that the Puritans placed a very, very, very uh, strong emphasis on learning. The Bible, it is, the book that is open there is almost certainly the Bible because every single Puritan knew how to read the Bible. And they very strongly focused on educating their children to be able to read so that their children could also read the Bible. Behind this Puritan leader is the globe, which, sug uh, which suggests that the Puritans were willing to, trans uh, to transport themselves from England to the Americas in order to establish the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a beacon of hope to the world, a place where the right kind of Christianity is being practiced. You'll notice that the wife of the Puritan is leaning in and listening to what he has to say. This painting says a lot about the role of men and women in Puritan society. The man is speaking and his wife is listening. You can learn a lot more about the Puritans in our second reading for this unit. Um, it's entitled The Puritan Life. Please read that as well and take some notes on Puritan culture. One thing you'll notice is that the, there's always this emphasis on Puritan hats with buckles on them and buckles on their shoes and buckles on their belts. I'm here to tell you right now, that the Puritans did not have buckles on their hats. Buckles were a later invention. They never existed at this time. It's one of those big lies that you've been taught in earlier classes. Anyway, what do all the following words have in common? A gift, sorry for sin. Thanks, joy and sorrow, abuse not, dust, humiliation, patience, silence, obedience, and fear. Well, these are all Puritan names, believe it or not. It goes to show just how much the Puritans uh, emphasized Christian teachings and Christian values. This is a really good one. Go break down to the ashes. That's actually a name too. And here's my favorite. If Christ had not de died for thou hast been damned. How crazy is that? Very, very, very long and very ridiculous. The Puritans clearly took religion very seriously. What if you didn't agree with them? Well, here's where the story gets kind of interesting because while the Puritans traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to escape being persecuted or treated with hostility by the English, they treated people who disagreed with them with quite a bit of hostility. And they tried to convert them to their uh, line of thinking. And if you disagreed with them and you said so out loud, you were punished. 
In this case, this man is standing in the middle of the town square with a sign around his neck. And, he's, and this is happening so that he can be humiliated by the other Puritans. The Puritans would use the stocks as well. And this was a really common punishment in Europe. You break a law, you mess up, you get put in the stocks for a day, sometimes a couple, several days. People walk past and they ridicule you. They shame you. They call you names. It's all to make you feel humiliated so you change your mind. Of course, it's always harder for the women. This picture shows a woman being subjected to the ducking stool. If a woman was disobedient to her husband in Puritan society, if she was suspected of witchcraft, she would be plunged in cold water repeatedly until, well, she confessed. Pretty grim stuff. I should point out that the Puritan's world was very much a man's world. Women were second-class citizens. And that was uh, one of the major things that they taught in Puritan churches. Puritans also really went after these folks, the Quakers. Believe it or not, the Quakers have far more to do than just oatmeal. They're very important to American history. The Quakers were the first Christian group in America to say that slavery is a sin and should be abolished or outlawed. They're also the first Christian group in America to say that men and women should have equal rights and that women should also be able to serve as ministers in the church. A famous American Quaker was a lady named Mary Dyer. Mary Dyer kept preaching that women and men are equal, and she kept preaching that slavery is wrong and other Quaker ideas. So the Puritans banished her. They booted her out of Massachusetts. Mary Dyer came back. She continued to preach her gospel, and the Puritans banished her again. They booted her out a second time. What did Mary Dyer do? Well, she returned. And this time around, the Puritans decided that they needed to execute her. So number 28 in your study guide basically points out that the, the Puritans persecuted anybody who did not agree with their kind of religion. And they especially persecuted Quakers like Mary Dyer. So things are looking pretty grim in Massachusetts. People are not allowed to worship freely. And if they disagree with what the church says, they get punished or booted out of Massachusetts altogether. This old change is, well, it doesn't change, but a hero does step into the midst. And that person's name is Roger Williams. Roger Williams was a Puritan. And he was also a very, very, very esteemed biblical scholar. He knew the good book forwards and backwards. And so he traveled throughout Massachusetts, giving sermons about the Bible and teaching people about the Bible. But the Puritan church leaders started noticing that Roger Williams was expressing some pretty bizarre, strange ideas that they did not agree with. For example, Roger Williams insisted that the government should not have any say in what people believe. He said this, Forced worship stinks in the nostrils of God. In other words, you can't force somebody to worship in some particular way. God does not like that. It is bad business. He expressed other unusual opinions too. For example, he said that the Puritans should actually pay the Indians for the land that they take. This outraged church leaders enough that, like everybody else who disagreed with them, they banished Roger Williams. They were going to throw him in chains, toss him in a ship, and send him back to England. Roger Williams was heard about this plan. He escaped them, and he ran off. And actually, he lived among the Indians for several years. Other people who were booted out of Massachusetts followed him and settled in what is today modern-day Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Plymouth Colony were threatening to go to war with this upstart colony near Rhode Island. And so John Winthrop, or I'm sorry, Roger Williams traveled to England, basically to get permission from the king to start a new colony. And he was successful. This is Roger Williams returning to Rhode Island with a charter charter of 1644 
This charter created the colony of Rhode Island. The colony of Rhode Island, right in its charter, had nothing to do or basically did not mention any specific kind of religion that had to be practiced there. Instead, it said that people are to walk as their conscience persuade them. In other words, people are to believe what they want to believe based off of their conscience, and the government of Rhode Island at this colony will not do anything about it. They will not be punished for their religious beliefs. This is what the Massachusetts Bay Colony and Plymouth Colony looked like before Roger Williams. In just 50 years, however, we see all of these other little colonies popping up. You see Rhode Island down there in the blue. You see Connecticut. You see New Hampshire. And the funny thing is that all these new colonies were established for the exact same reason. Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson established Rhode Island in order to escape religious persecution from the pilgrims. John Wilwright established New Hampshire in order to escape religious persecution from the pilgrims. Thomas Hooker established Connecticut in order to escape persecution from the pilgrims. Clearly you should see a pattern here. All these new colonies granted religious freedom to their subjects. So people living in Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island. In these places, you were allowed to practice your religion the way you wanted to practice your religion. Roger Williams has started a major trend, and that trend is called the separation of church and state. The separation of church and state is the principle that the government must permit the freedom of worship. The government cannot force a certain religion on its people. The separation of church and state is one of the most important principles of our Constitution and one of those special aspects of being an American that I think should be celebrated. Because with the separation of church and state, religious conflict is reduced since people can worship freely in our country. I think right now you have enough information to answer essential question five in your study guides. Please do so. Thanks for tuning in uh, and have a great day.